I'm going to start. The, okay. And I'm going to start now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third of the Talking Lockdown with Arts Richmond. I will now hand you over to our president, Sir Vince Cable. Thank you. Well, could I welcome back our audience and, and any newcomers for the uh, final uh, episode in this series? Um, and I particularly thank you know the, the, the backup um, personnel in Arts Richmond, Hilary Dodman, Sue Pandit in particular, who made this very imaginative uh, project a success. And perhaps I would just say, since this is the final um, episode in the series, um, I mean, I, my role as president is ornamental, but uh, I, what I have been, you know, full of admiration for is the ingenuity of so many of our arts groups and key arts personnel in doing some really remarkable things in very difficult circumstances. And it's also whetted my appetite for what will, I'm sure, be a kind of flood of uh, very creative productions when we finally get out of this, hopefully in a few weeks' time. But what I'd just like to do now is give a, a brief sketch of the uh, four speakers we have tonight, and they'll be introduced in more detail later. But first of all, Susie Rowland, who is an author and also a, a parent of an autistic child and, and is using her, uh, her skills as a writer to help other parents deal with the problems of autism. I know from my work as MPs, a large number of local parents who are, have dreadful problems accessing support. Um, and I'm sure Susie's work is very important in that respect. Um, Leslie Bussin, uh, who has a very varied experience as, a, as an actor and a jazz singer, but is now managing the Landmark Center, which many of us has used as an important facility for concerts, art exhibitions, and so on. Uh, Brioni Metayard, who uh, has been running a theater workshop Ignite Me, um, which has been doing uh, online theatrical work uh, during the lockdown, and she'll explain how that's done. And last but not least, Kate uh, Silverton, who is one of the best known faces in the country, uh, reading, the, reading the news, uh, a broadcaster, and, and uh, all the background associated with that. And I think many of us remember also her appearances on Strictly Come Dancing too, but she's here to talk about neither of those things, but her new book, which is that there is no such thing as naughty, which is a former parent I will approach with some skepticism, but I'm ready to be persuaded. Uh, so uh, welcome, Susie. You're the first of our speakers. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Nick George, Chairman of Arts Richmond. Uh, thank you, Sir Vince. Uh, yes, indeed, this is the last of, of three of our first run, hopefully, of Talking Lockdown. Um, we're already pretty sure we're going to be doing this again at some point because it has been very successful. And we've all enjoyed uh, doing it and, and hearing our wonderful panellists in the last two. And I don't think uh, this evening is going to be any, ex any exception. I think we've got some really, really interesting speakers. So um, we're like the previous two times, we're gonna do a QA and a at the end. Uh, so if you've got any questions while the speakers are speaking, then please input them, just type them into that. And then when everybody's done, we'll do a QA and a session at the end, we'll run through and the speakers will be able to speak to each other and, and ask questions of each other as well. So keep the questions coming, we've had some really good ones. Um, one last thing is that you, may be more comfortable watching the speakers on speaker view and then when we go to the Q&A afterwards go back to gallery view and then you can see um, everybody uh, who's involved. So without further ado I very much would like to welcome our first speaker tonight who is Susie Rowland and uh, she's an author as uh, Sir Vince said um, autism and ADHD specialist trainer and cognitive behavior therapist and poet that wasn't enough. She founded the Hashtag Happy in School project to help families and educators effectively manage the significant issues around educating neurodiverse youngsters, which are, as, as uh, has been already said, very significant indeed. Her book, SCND in the Clowns, a handbook for parents of ASH and ADHD diagnosed young people was published in September 2020. The book received an endorsement from the National Autistic Society 
with many positive emotional reviews from parents and professionals. Her son's own um, autism and ADHD diagnosis took several years with many twists and turns. Eventually, she turned her diary entries into an astounding practical guide, which already is, is helping other parents and educators. SEND in the clouds is available on Amazon and will soon also be in bookshops. Susie is a strong keynote, keynote speaker, having given talks for the National Autistic Society and the Jessica Kingsley Publishing in September 2021, with further talks for the TESS SEN show, as well as for various schools and special educational needs conferences. She writes articles and blogs on uh, SEN, diversity, parenting, education, and well-being. So I'd very much like to welcome to our virtual floor, Susie Rowland. Thank you very much, Nick, for that um, introduction. And thank you, um, Sir Vince, and good evening, everybody. It's a delight to be here this evening. And um, sit back and relax, and I'm going to read the first of the contributions for you. March 18, 2020. There are rumblings at school that school will need to close. My 15 year old is worried about his GCSEs. March 20, school is closed. There were tears, signed t-shirts and universal shock, even from teachers. They did their best to create a positive send off under a cloud of uncertainty and fear. A week or so later, we're in full lockdown. My sole trader business, Happy in School Project, delivers bespoke training and consultancy for parents and schools around special educational needs. My business model appears to be highly vulnerable. I start digital networking, making connections with schools, charities and local authorities who I plan to work with after COVID. I read articles about funding for small businesses and I don't seem to meet any of the criteria as a sole trader. I haven't got time to dig around into .gov UK websites. I decide to spend the time in lockdown discovering how to adapt my offer to include digital training and workshops. I use the time also to complete my cognitive behaviour therapy certificate as well as finish the final few chapters of my first non-fiction book, Send in the Clowns. March 24, today is the Jack Petchy Achievement Award ceremony at the Clapham Grand, a glittering celebration event to recognize young people from across the country who have overcome mental health difficulties. My son is due to receive an award. The event is canceled. Two days later, I receive an email from a Kingston autism charity I deliver training for, advising that their annual conference is cancelled. I suggest they keep my ticket fee as a donation. Determined not to focus on negatives, I remind myself that we live in an affluent borough, in good quality housing, with outdoor space and excellent local parks. But daily news bulletins remind us that lockdown is crushingly difficult for so many families. As an entrepreneur, I'm starkly aware that it takes just one major income change for a family to fall into hardship. I'm taking part in some research from UCL about how lockdown is impacting parents with autistic children. I share our experiences with the researcher Lockdown with a neurodiverse team is intense. Jay's daily life has shrunk down to one darkened room, intense gaming, limited social interaction, and lots of anxiety about the future, as well as worry about teacher assessed grades. Then George Floyd was murdered by a policeman. The grief and shock from the black community was palpable and crept into our home. The sadness morphed into justifiable global anger. This is 2020. What has actually changed since the protests of the 1960s? The Black Lives Matter movement is being hotly debated. The world feels broken. Maybe racism is the other disease we should all turn our global attention to. The news tells us that Black and Asian people are more at risk from COVID. 
I think about how social and economic inequality impacts physical and mental health. June 2020. Hot sunny days bring some respite. I revel in family life, a new daily pattern which doesn't involve commuting. I'm experimenting with baking with reasonable results. You can't move for banana bread recipes online. The end of June publication date for my book, Send in the Clowns, is approaching. I've booked a photo shoot with a local photographer and between us, we've researched a perfect spot, the steps and gardens of Orleans House. We set up the shot, but as toilet facilities were still closed, there was nowhere for me to change. To the amusement of passers-by, I changed my clothes by hiding behind the photographer's reflective shield and touch up my lipstick using my mobile phone as a mirror. It feels like a big win for small business. July. My publisher emailed to say that we should postpone the publication of my book until September, as the bookshops are closed. I'm stoic. My son's 16th birthday is spent at home with cake. He's spending increasing hours alone in his room online, despite our many attempts to engage him in other activities. I use the delayed publication date of the book to ramp up my social media engagement and spend more time with him and learn more about the digital sales tools online. As a writer and trainer, the lockdown has taught me the need to always consider the what if. My pivot to digital communications is one I will look back on as a positive development for my business. There's no need to book expensive or inaccessible meeting rooms, and I can deliver face-to-face -face consultancy and training safely in line with government guidance. I'm not sure that distance learning was such a success for many children, particularly those with additional needs. The research from Special Needs Jungle, a blog, and other charities and institutions indicated that for some autistic children, the move to online learning was difficult and stressful, not to mention the pressure on their families. According to many research findings and my own experience with families, the first lockdown felt novel. The second one was a strain. At home, we had access to laptops, but Jay, my son, and many of his peers didn't like being on camera. It felt pressuring in a way that being in a classroom didn't. Small training and some consulting businesses have the benefit of being small, but big institutions like schools don't have the flexibility to respond as quickly to the various needs of their neurodiverse pupils, particularly in the pandemic. The strain and constant changes have impacted teachers too, with many teachers leaving the profession after their COVID experience. They have described feelings of helplessness and being unable to adequately provide the support and attention they know that neurodiverse children need to thrive in school. 71% of autistic children are taught in mainstream schools and according to the ADHD Foundation, approximately one child in every 30 has ADHD in a mainstream non-selective school. This figure may be higher as autism coexists with ADHD in many children. Both of these conditions require expert knowledge input and clear school leadership to ensure children with these conditions are not unduly disadvantaged by their school experience. September, my new book launch month. I've organized a socially distanced, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I've organized a socially distanced launch event with a handful of parents. We will meet at the Woodland Gardens in Bushy Park. Thankfully, it was a warm and sunny day. Sending the clowns was out in the world. I felt elated. I understood and understand still firsthand the difficulties parents with disabled children are facing during lockdown. Lost or changed routines, little or no support in school, anxieties about health, schoolwork, missing friends, 
and the virus. Parents' own anxieties about whether their kids are better off at home or in school. Trying to work from home and oversee your children's home learning or going out to work worrying about childcare. Once the book was published, it felt like I was playing a small part, at least, in helping parents to understand their child's diagnosis and its impact on their education. I have been impressed by how local organisations like ADHD Richmond and Kingston, Skylarks, Fast Minds Adult ADHD Support Group have ploughed ahead to deliver an incredible range of services to support families and disabled children in the borough. For many, this has been a lifeline. In terms of the arts, my son attends a youth club run by Knott's Arts, who deliver a wide range of activities in the borough. They carried on with their drama and social communications workshops online during COVID, and poetry performance also continued to deliver monthly, monthly meetings online, bringing comfort and poetry directly into our living rooms. August 2020, GCSE Adults Day. Driving to school felt weird, watching Jay rush in and out of the school gates and return with an A4 envelope of results and a school mug. He got eight GCSEs and looked relieved. I noticed lots of teens throwing their arms around each other, overcome with emotion about results and seeing their friends again. It was touching. We didn't go for a burger afterwards. October. My son is starting sixth form college, just as we go back into lockdown. His autism diagnosis means he's more susceptible to anxiety and has difficulty making friends and reading body language. The first term behind masks was very difficult. His pastoral support team, however, were excellent. Like everything else COVID related, there's always a positive human contrast to offset the pain and confusion. December, the end, the year ended on a high. I was asked to speak at the National Autistic Society Conference on Mental Health in 2021. We had survived the year and 2021 would be so different. Looking ahead, the remind, remainder of 2021 is busy I'll be delivering two sessions at the Times Educational Supplement SEM Special Educational Needs Conference in October, a Governor's Conference in Hampshire in November discussing funding applications with a head teacher from an alternative provision school, as well as delivering many parents and school webinars in the summer, particularly with early years practitioners. I've also been commissioned to write a new book about school anxiety and school avoidance. But lastly, and most important of all, I, I will be ensuring that as a family, we look after our mental, emotional, emotional and physical health. Thank you for listening. And I really apologize for all of the disruptions with my phone. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me now. I was just uh, saying thank you very much, Susie, and don't worry about that. I was really concerned it, was, it wasn't my phone, um, but uh, that was very uh, moving, and uh, 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 thank you for, for that. We'll come back to quite a few questions which I've seen have already come in uh, later on, but now I'd just like to introduce our second speaker this evening, Leslie Bozin is the manager of the Landmark Arts Centre in Teddington. She describes her life in the arts as a series of happy accidents rather than a carefully planned career. From an early age, her passion was acting and she began her working life as an actor and much of her spare time singing with various jazz musicians. Joining the Landmark in 2008, after a 21 career in the museum sector, the last 10 of which she was director of, of an industrial museum, in her presentation, she will share her experience of the profound effect the pandemic has had on both her and the landmark. Welcome, Leslie. 
Thank, thank you, Nick. And thanks very much to Arts Richmond for inviting me to be part of this very interesting series of events. I split my talk roughly into three parts. Impact of COVID on me professionally and on the Landmark Arts Centre, how we've responded to successive lockdowns and what we've learned along the way, how our experience over the past year has influenced our plans for the future, both immediately and in the longer term. So I'll start with COVID and its impact on me and the Landmark. I remember back in January 2020, COVID got a short mention under AOB at a trustees meeting by me and vividly I remember one trustee saying it's not a real issue we shouldn't worry about it. By February's board meeting COVID had made it to my formal board report with a whole paragraph about hand washing procedures and putting up government signage I don't think we then realised what a significant threat it could be to our organisation. March the 12th, we had the phone ringing all the time with users asking what was happening about cancellation policies for concerts and classes. And then two days later, we took the very tough decision to postpone our annual contemporary textiles fair, which was due to take place on March the 20th to the 22nd. That one decision cost us £20,000 overnight because in lost income and irrecoverable costs on advertising and things that we'd already spent, it was a really tough decision to make. And then on March the 14th, we held what was to be our last live event until September 2020. Not surprisingly, half the ticket holders turned up to the concert. So like everybody else, by then we knew that it was serious, but when we closed on March the 16th and started the long and dispiriting job of phoning ticket holders, like most people, I don't think we still had any real idea of what the impact of this virus would be upon us as individuals and as an organisation. An emergency meeting with my chairman and finance trustee very quickly took place. And that revealed that despite what we had always thought to be a very prudent and healthy reserves level, worst case scenario of having to pay back tens of thousands in advance sales, pay creditors and make provision for staff redundancy, would leave the landmark pretty much bankrupt by mid-May, which coincidentally would have been just in time for our 25th birthday. But surely we thought the worst case wouldn't happen. and We thought we might be closed for a month, possibly six weeks tops. By the end of March last year, I was confronting the very real possibility that everything I'd striven to do at the landmark for the last 12 years was going to abruptly disappear. I was calculating how long my redundancy pay would last and what the chances were that I would get another job. But also at that point, I set myself two objectives. First was to do my utmost to stop the landmark from going under, and the second was to avoid making any of our small team redundant. So far, thanks to the amazing support of local people, the Cultural Recovery Fund, Government Furlough Scheme and the Local Business Support Grants, both the landmark and the staff are still here. We've still got a long way to go to return to being a vibrant, viable organisation, we are still here. Past year, well, it's been horrendous for everyone. And personally, apart from worrying about loved ones, in October 2020, when we got our first Cultural Recovery Fund grant, I suddenly realised that I hadn't slept properly since March 2020. And the day we got that decision, I actually slept properly right through the night. With the rest of my team furloughed, up until then I'd found myself working 12 to 14 hours a day, often six or seven days a week, because not only was I doing my job, I was having to do what I could of their job too. I found one of the biggest strains was our weekly team catch-ups. I had to try and remain upbeat and positive to support them whilst at the same time dealing with the fact that they were very uncertain about their future and also that they were very frustrated that because they were furloughed, they couldn't help me. They could see that I needed help, but they were unable to give that help. 
I found I had to try and tread a fine balance between being honest with them about our predicament, but also mindful of the uncertainty that I knew they were feeling at the time. So as well as talking about how the fundraising campaign was going, we used to regularly swap gardening tips and recipes and show pictures of anything that we'd been doing to try and encourage everybody to keep going. And that was so important to all our mental health. Like many people, I became obsessed with the Downing Street five o'clock briefings and the government COVID website was a daily check for me to see if there were any details in the announcements that would throw a lifeline to the landmark. I may not be checking the government website every single day and I no longer tune into all the briefings, but the government website is still a very valuable source of information. And what's kept me going through all of this, and it still does, is the fact that this isn't my fault or the landmark's fault. It's a global crisis, and that's what we have to remember. So what have we learned? Well, we've actually learned a huge number of things as an organisation. We'd always hoped that if we were ever under serious threat, our local community would come together and feel we were worth saving. And my goodness, they have done that launched a Save the Landmark appeal in early April 2020 and when the end of last year we had had over 1,100 people donate a staggering £76,000 to that appeal. That has been truly humbling and on top of their money often people have sent us cards and messages of support that have really helped me and the rest of the team with our morale. They've said how much they miss coming to the landmark, how important coming to classes and events has been to their life and how they can't wait to come back. And I cannot overemphasize how important that was to us as well as the money. And then the majority of people who booked for a class or event very kindly donated their fee or accepted a credit did nearly 155 artists who were booked in for two art fairs that of course couldn't take place last year almost all of them were able to say credit it or in some cases they donated it and when you bear in mind that so many of these are independent artists again it was truly humbling that they felt the landmark was that important that they would do what they could in their small way to help us that all gave us valuable time to prepare emergency budgets and also to extract the reserves funds that we did have so that if we did have to close the business, we could do so speedily, pay our creditors and pay redundancy. I think a lot of people were quite surprised to discover when we were honest and open with people about the true cost of running the landmark. We are a charity and up until the pandemic, we didn't receive any or funding at all. And it costs an average of £15,000 a month to open the doors. And even when it's closed with insurance and all those contract costs that you can't just stop on a whim, it costs £6,000 just to keep the building closed and locked up. And even stopping all essential spending at a stroke wouldn't really have a huge impact on that. We have many offers of practical help too. Very quickly, the traders of Teddington Together came to us and offered to run a virtual online 24 hour concert called Rock in the Lock In, and that raised nearly £4,000 alone. More recently, Teddington Society have organised three online recitals in support of the landmark, which has raised another £1,000. In September, local actor Amanda Root came up and got together an amazing cast of local actors, all professionals, but who lived locally. And together they donated their time to put on an amazing play in the round in the landmark. And over two sold out nights, they raised 8,000 pounds for us. We're really pleased that Amanda together with Jed Mercurio have both agreed to become our new landmark patrons. Both of those relationships have developed out of this awful crisis and we're really grateful for that. We've also pulled together as a team from the trustees, some of whom came on board after we closed and still haven't been able to see the landmark operating on a normal basis. And of course the staff and not forgetting our volunteers 
some of whom have pounded the streets of Teddington and other areas, stuffing letters through people's letterboxes, appealing for their support. And I think, despite the strain of all that, it has brought us closer together as an organisation, and I'm sure that we will emerge as a stronger charity, despite the financial and emotional strain. So what about the future? Well, I might be giving you the impression that the landmark has had, for want of a better phrase, a good war. Well, we haven't, of course we haven't. And I use the word war advisedly because to me, COVID is a war. It's a war on our global society, on our economies, and of course, most importantly, on our health. We haven't had a good war. It's been the most stressful time of my life. And although I and the landmark have learned a lot over the past 13 months, I have no desire to go through it all again. Over the past year, we've lost supporters and colleagues to COVID who were also very dear friends. We've seen a number of independent arts providers who, arts providers who used to use our facilities go under. We've watched every penny rigorously and cut costs to the bone to make our funds stretch. We've had to operate at a loss, not through mismanagement, but because of the restrictions that continue on our activities. And of course, we want to get back to welcoming 329 people into our building for a concert, rather than the 70 that we're currently allowed under social distancing restrictions. We want to have our art studio in operation morning, noon and night. We want to fill our amazing space with creativity and the buzz of people having a good time, sharing experiences with others and doing what they enjoy. So when you can, Please come back. We've got so much that we want to share with you, starting this weekend with our printmaking festival, which incidentally you can get a glimpse of the lovely normal people and flea bag cast signed print that we're raffling off, our latest attempt to raise money. That event is free and you can still book tickets for it via our website. And then in June and July, we're going to start bringing back concerts. Full details are on our website and you can sign up to our mailing list. Looking further afield, COVID has given us a very, very valuable chance to stop our programme, look at what we're doing and think, are we actually doing what we want to do to the best of our ability and serving our community to the best of our ability? So over the next few months, from September 2021 and through into next year, we're going to be starting to take a fresh approach to how we programme activities at the Landmark. And we will be asking your thoughts and opinions on what we're doing. And we're going to be having a very active programme. So if you haven't been to see us, or if you hadn't been to see us before we locked down, maybe you'd never been through the door, give it a try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. On behalf of, uh, of the performing arts groups in Richmond and around, we're very glad you got through lockdown. Okay, so I'd now like to introduce our third speaker, uh, Bryony Mettiyard from the Ignite Me workshop. Bryony is passionate about raising the bar for well-being in children's schools, particularly for autistic and ADHD children, using mindfulness cognitive behavioural therapy, group work, storytelling, and empathy as her tools. Welcome, Riley. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me at this very valuable event. Ignite Me Workshop Theatre is an inclusive theatre company working with disabled and disadvantaged actors and non-actors, creating plays based on real experience, using theatre of the oppressed methods developed by Augusto Boal, we run workshops using games, image theatre, improvisation and storytelling, leading to performances that give a voice to marginalised people to speak their truth. I established Ignite Me in 2017 and I'm its current director. I am a disabled theatre for development practitioner and theatre maker. The company has grown to a team of eight drama facilitators. We believe disabled actors are invisible in the industry and disabled people are underrepresented in leadership roles. At Ignite Me, 
our participants become leaders and disabled people lead through lived experience. Working with dis deaf and disabled people's organisations, charities and colleges across London, we involve diverse groups. <clears throat> Members of our team have been trained in Inclusion London's Developing Deaf and Disabled Leaders of the Future programme. The programme enabled us to build new partnerships with disabled advocates embedded in the disability rights movement. Before COVID-19, before the pandemic, we facilitated workshops in the local community. We worked with local organisations, including Rules, Age UK and Multicultural Richmond. We performed at the Lyric, the Exchange and the House of Commons. Our theatre is inherently political because it comes directly from people. Performances are participatory, involving inclusive community audiences, politicians and other decision makers. Both actors and audiences influence the outcomes of performances, becoming agents of change. During lockdown, the venues where we worked were closed and we could not continue our project as planned. The project People's Theatre for Marginalised Adults is funded by the Mayor of London's Culture Seeds. We have been forced to adapt and innovate and we started running Zoom workshops with performances live streamed on YouTube. We facilitated three courses of workshops and are currently in the middle of our fourth, reaching out to people, many of whom have been shielding. Every week over two hours, we set performance games and exercising sizes, providing a safe space where people can have fun, learn new skills, meet people and share issues using drama as their tool. Our work reflects a disabled experience of lockdown from shielding to loneliness, mask wearing to hospital appointments, access to vaccines. We create a space for people to connect. Participants feedback has been very positive and many have returned to connect and do drama. In our workshops, the current series is called Trapped in Zoom Land. We use a range, oh, one moment, sorry. We use a range of methods. Our participants connect with their inner voice and their true selves. Connection is vital during these unprecedented times. Lockdown has had a profoundly negative impact on the mental health of many people, particularly disabled, elderly and isolated people. Time and again, our workshops have proved beneficial to the mental health and well-being of our participants. We want to help disabled adults have a voice and to support participants to become leaders, express themselves and help create a more neurodiverse, open, inclusive society, making it clear that there is nothing about us without us. At the outset, working to these aims, I could not envision how it would be possible to do this digitally. I panicked at the beginning of lockdown because I could see its detrimental effect on our projects and participants. The people we support have become more isolated due to having to shield. Face masks have become a barrier to deaf people being able to engage. Digital exclusion because of low computer literacy leads to further isolation. Our elderly participants are scared to go out. Stress and anxiety lead to poor mental health and some people face discrimination in public for not wearing a mask despite being exempt. Many people in our community are alone and extremely distressed by the pandemic and the difficulties accessing essential items from food to medicine. Isolation is hard for many. By running free workshops and providing a forum for fun, open self-expression about experiences, fears and desires, we hope to continue being a vital lifeline for our users. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Due to taking our work online, we have engaged new participants, some of whom come from other London boroughs. We continue to offer our workshops digitally because we see this as the way ahead. We have engaged a wider audience and people who would not normally engage in arts activity. We will also return to our community work 
when restrictions permit, but we will have to re-engage our participants. We are able to send up and laugh about many of the difficulties we face. We use humour rather than anger or disappointment. Laughter is one of the most effective ways to engage with people and encourage others to come forward. Local and national politicians have shown an interest in our work. We have a political mission to change perceptions of disabled people as vulnerable or as the passive receivers of care and raise awareness of their circumstances. We hope to use our grassroots project to bring about change. We want to continue our online workshops for local community organizations, promote our work, restart face-to-face -face, our face-to-face -face workshop program at Marble Hill Park, Twickenham Wellbeing Center, Multicultural Richmond and Ham Youth Service with a view to participatory outdoor performances. We now see the importance of working in new ways to achieve our aims. Our YouTube performances receive high viewing numbers we have realized that we have created an online community and we want to keep it thriving and reach out further. I will now tell you about two case studies of actors we work with. Case study D, when D first joined our Zoom workshops, he lacked the confidence to reach out, he, <clears throat> to even come near the screen. He sat on the other side of the room and watched but did not participate. Gradually, as the workshops went on, he moved closer and closer to the rest of the group on the screen. Dee has Down syndrome, and because of his disability, he faces barriers to engaging in social and arts activities, which can be elitist and not open to all. After two courses of workshops, Dee is engaged and actively participates in our activities. He has performed in two YouTube performances. He sympathizes both with characters and other group members. After Christmas, he could not wait for the workshops to get started again. Case study F. Two of our actors are trustees of an advocacy organization for people with learning disabilities. They bring their expertise and experience to the rehearsal process. By getting involved in our workshops, they have grown in confidence as facilitators. This is diffused into their lives as they are speaking up for themselves and others, as well as taking more self-confident and empowered leadership roles. Their awareness of the issues that affect disabled people, which they bring to the workshops and performances, comes from their knowledge of the everyday lives of disabled people. But for all of the actors, it is their own life experience as disabled people. That is what we put on stage or screen. I would now like to share with you two examples of workshops. The first one from early on in the process and the second from later. Our most recent performance was in Marble Hill Park. The play was called Locked In. Workshop rehearsals were mainly online via Zoom. Then we brought people together in person in September when we facilitated five rehearsals in Marble Hill Park before performing on a very cold day in September to an audience of over 50 people. The third workshop was on Zoom. We started with a name game where each participant says their name, something they like and something they don't like. This was an icebreaker and people were able to get to know each other a bit better. We then played a game which was devised by a member of our team who has learning disabilities. He led the game and demonstrated by having a conversation with another facilitator where each new phrase had to begin with the next letter of the alphabet. Then it was over to the participants. This engaged our participants and had them working as a team to create an alphabet conversation. It was a challenge for the whole group. We have tried at this by introducing different themes and also by acting as different letters. We then played one of our old favorite games, Sound Jam, where each person comes up with their own short rhythm, sound or melody, where we work together to create a piece. We did what we called isolation improvisation. We have been gathering scenarios through storytelling. Those scenarios are based on true experiences and paint a picture of the disabled experience of lockdown, isolation and the pandemic. These early improvisations were in preparation for a performance that we planned when COVID restrictions permitted. 
Another activity in this workshop was to make a recording of the Zoom meeting to create a short film about falling in love with yourself. In September, restrictions did ease and we were permitted to perform a socially distanced event in Marble Hill Park at the end of their season of events. We have been devising and rehearsing scenes on Zoom and presented a play called Locked In after just five in-person rehearsals in the park. Some of us had never met in person before. We publicized the play on social media, as well as putting posters and flyers in local businesses and community centers. The play was improvised and came directly from the actors' experiences. This brought passion and truth to the performance. We had worked on improvising our scenarios with different actors taking it in turns to take on the different roles. The actors were involved from beginning to end in researching, devising and performing, so they knew their material back to front. Locked In was a forum theatre play with a difference. Instead of the spectators participating by joining the actors on stage and acting with them to resolve conflict, members of the audience made suggestions into a sanitised microphone at the side of the stage. The actors then appeared to improvise based on their suggestions. We had in fact preempted some of what the audience might suggest and had rehearsed alternative scenarios. For myself, lockdown has had the effect of making me feel stressed and anxious in my professional life. Others that I work with have experienced similar stress and have had to have time off, but just short breaks. Working from home in isolation has taken its toll and we have all experienced Zoom fatigue and migraines. The shift from in-person workshops at community locations to delivering Zoom workshops where each facilitator is in a different location has been a challenge. We are still learning. Up until now, participants have joined the workshops individually from their homes, but last week we started a drama therapy course with a class of nine, all on one screen. They are students with learning disabilities from a London-based college. Financially, Ignite Me has been affected, but not as much as many others. We started a project and paid for venue hire. We then had to suspend the project, so funds were wasted, but I was able to recoup them from the Arts Council. Our freelance staff were furloughed from their other part-time jobs. They are people people, so not being able to give hugs and high fives to show affection has been very hard for them. Some of our freelance have had to shield for three months from March to May. They experience boredom, frustration and severe loneliness due to the enforced isolation. The Arts Council was helpful in offering emergency funding before lockdown, I secured funding from Culture Seeds. The General London Authority were understanding about the grant being spent differently and extended the project completion deadline to May this year, which took some of the pressure off. That there could have been more financial support offered for freelancers and also trustees and directors who slipped through the net. If we face another lockdown, that would be my bid for improvement in terms of funding. What has impressed me and others' response to lockdown is the resilience, commitment and hard work of the organisations we work in partnership with, Rules Independent Living based in Teddington, Multicultural Richmond in Twickenham, a youth club we work with in Ham and others. I have learnt that this, it is possible to work in different ways and explore new options as that was the imperative. We will continue to keep exploring. If faced with another, another major lockdown, I would panic less about the future and perhaps would adapt more quickly. We have secured funding from Make London and we will use it to deliver a new project called Make Inclusive Theatre Online Richmond. The project is a combination of online and in-person workshops and performances as well as an audio tour using QR codes positioned at different locations around the borough. So look out for those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bryony. And uh, now I can, well, I can see we have a lot of questions coming through at the moment. So uh, we're gonna have a full on Q and A 
uh, session uh, at the end. Now it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome our final speaker this evening. Kate Silverton is a journalist, newsreader, and broadcaster working for the BBC. Generally, as a main relief presenter, Kate can be seen regularly presenting the BBC News at One, where I uh, gather she's also currently the deputy presenter. Uh, the BBC News at Six, News at Ten, and BBC Weekend News, and is currently, uh, and, and, and as well as making appearances on uh, BBC, the BBC News Channel and BBC World News. Well, if that wasn't enough, in 2018, she participated in series 16 of the BBC's Strictly Come Dancing, pairing with professional dancer Aliash Skoyanyek, I hope I pronounced that right, Skoyanyek, and amongst other things, Kate will be discussing her new book, There Is No Such Thing As Naughty. Kate, welcome to our virtual floor. Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, thank you to, uh, to uh, Susie, Leslie and Bryony to um, I, actually on that, Nick, because we've had, I've, I've been watching all these amazing uh, questions coming in and I would like to just actually say to Susie, Leslie, Bryony, if you would like to, because there's so many questions here, just in case we don't get time to get through everybody, there is that thing that we can type an answer to you as well. So um, don't feel that you have to listen to me. Maybe you want to be answering some of those questions while I'm while I'm chatting. But um, yeah, so thank you very much to Vince for inviting me to speak about lockdown. I am a local resident. And well, where do we begin with lockdown really? I think we've we've heard so much in terms of the different experiences. We know that for some people, I've heard it said it's been a blessing. It's been given people time to spend more time with their families, to feel closer to their relatives, um, albeit uh, virtually most often, um, and to focus on the things that we cherish. However, it has been, as we've just been hearing, far from an equal experience and um, not least for parents with young children. And so where I come at this is, is I've returned to my academic roots in child uh, psychology and having become a parent, um, my children were eight and five last year. So in the thick of uh, everything, um, uh, I've spent the last 10 to 15 years working with psychiatrists, neuroscientists and psychotherapists really understanding how we can parent a healthy brain. I really came at it thinking that I wanted to really, um, to, to, I'm just trying to change my screen. Sorry, it's just gone off a little bit. There's me in tech, I should know better, shouldn't I? Um, so I wanted to learn how to parent a healthy brain. And what I had learned through my studies, and I've started training now, I'm a counsellor on placement. I work in um, a school as a counsellor on placement now um, uh, in a local primary school. And I'm going on to my master's as a child psychotherapist in September. So all of my studies were informing me as both a mum um, and also in terms of my studies. And I was standing at the school gate and speaking to parents last year who were telling me about the different behaviours that their children were expressing and very distressing behaviours. So um, one little girl had started to bang her head against the wall and clearly um, the parents were distressed and I connected them with one of the charities I work with, the Anna Freud Centre, um, to see if they could get help. And of course, we all know how fraught services are for children. We've heard the testimony and, and, and Susie and Brani will, will know it from personal experience that um, it can be very tough and not least in the current environment. And so I started writing some newspaper articles talking about our other most vulnerable members of our society, our children, and um, just highlighting how, and I think Susie, you put it, crushingly difficult it was for parents, particularly when they were homeschooling. It was my experience because I was doing it as well. And I had had this information in my head about uh, what I've been learning in terms of children's mental health and how we parent a healthy brain. And I set out to start writing these articles and it kind of became a book and the book is called there's no such thing as naughty it's directed at uh, parents with children from conception to five because they are the most significant years for our brain development for all our brain development and what I wanted to do is create something that could disseminate all this incredible knowledge that I had 
been privileged to learn from these neuroscientists and psychiatrists and all the charities that I'd been working with and to put that knowledge out there but in the simplest way possible, because what I was studying was the brain. And when we start talking about anxiety, we are talking about the amygdala, the fear center in the brain and, um, and our reptilian brain, our survival brain. And I was trying to convey all this incredible knowledge in the simplest way possible, because I wanted it to make sense to me as much as everybody else. And so what I set out to do was to explain that when our children are acting out, our very young children with behavior that might traditionally have been seen as naughty, so Vince, um, actually behavior is communication. And so I really set out to distill and explain how our brains operate, how our children's brains develop, because I wanted for parents to feel empowered that where they weren't able to get the support that perhaps they needed more than ever in the current climate, that they could read this book and trust that the information in it was uh, full of um, really sort of hefty science, but written in a really simple way. So just to share a few things with you in terms of the brain development, because it is really, I think, relevant to what we've just been discussing and hearing in terms of the stories, because when we talk about anxiety, we're actually talking about a very ancient part of our brain that gets triggered. So uh, the first part of our brains when we're in the womb to, to develop is what I call in the book, the lizard brain. It's the same brain as reptiles have had for millions of years. And it's involved in the fight, flight, freeze response that, you know, we understand what we mean by that, I hope. And, um, and, and, and that's a, it's, a, uh, it's involved in whether we're hungry, thirsty, whether we're tired, our balance, all these things are regulated by what I call the lizard brain. I, obviously it's not a lizard in our heads, but I think of it as a little lizard and it can either, it can either startle if it's scared, it might run away or it might throw itself up and, you know, um, to scare something off. And that's what we humans have. When we are anxious, the, this is where fear starts in our reptilian brain. It's important to understand because it, our lizard acts without conscious thought. It's our survival brain. So it acts very quickly. We don't have much control over it because it's out there. If you think of a lizard, I'm hungry, quick as a flash, tongue goes out, catches a fly, lunch is done. And that's what we are driven by. Our babies are driven by very much in the womb in the first year of life. And when we are anxious ourselves, when we've had all the messaging that we've had, the negative messaging, the narrative, the masks, it is actually tapping into that part of our brain. And it's important to remember that because that's the bit that we have to start helping uh, regulate if we are to sort of bring ourselves back to calm as adults. For our children, we then look at the, the limbic system, which is the emotional part, which I call the baboon, because I liken it to my toddler who was a little baboon when he was younger. You know, that kind of behavior that we associate with young children, which is never mind the P's and Q's. It's all about me. It's all about, am I hang angry? Am I happy? Am I joyful? Am I sad? It's all the big emotions and the memories sit in the limbic system, what I think of as the baboon. Now, as adults, what we have is what I call the wise owl, which is the prefrontal cortex. And it's the bit that allows us to make sense of things, to sit here talking to all of you tonight, uh, still being a little bit nervous while we're doing it, but actually saying it's OK, everybody's friendly and that we can think about the future and the past. We can bring ourselves back to balance. We can think I'm going to just do some breathing exercises because I'm a little bit anxious tonight. Wonderful. The prefrontal cortex is, is a beautiful thing. It's what where we get our empathy from. The important thing to understand with our children, and especially at the moment for our very young children, they do not have a fully developed wise owl. They have what I think of in the book, I reference it as a fluffy owlet, because our brains develop in a sort of hierarchy, as it were. And in the first few years of life, our brains are developing at a pace. We, we are born with immature brains. And that's really important to remember as parents in this current climate, and anybody who's caring for children, because we have to forgive our children their big behavior in these moments and more so at the moment because it's gonna be even more when we're anxious, it's gonna drive the lizard and the baboon to be up and off out the gates before the little fluffy owlet can even sort of swoop down and scoop them up in the comfort of her wings. That's what we need to do for each other and for our children is to be the wise owl that we can regulate our children. And I'm just keeping an eye on the time. 
um, because I want to get to want to give you a chance to sort of ask as many questions as possible. But the other important thing in the book, and I give lots of tips and tools and tricks that are all been endorsed by the NSPCC, the uh, place to be, the Anna Freud Center, um, the leading lights of mental health, children's mental health, have all endorsed the book um, because they say it's going to help parents to um, lay the foundations for good future mental health in our children. And as you can probably hear, I'm passionate about it. And I'm, I'm so delighted to have got the support that I've had and parents of feeding back Joe Wicks and others who are saying that the tips and tools in the book where we haven't got necessarily therapists to help our children in these moments, um, we can do that ourselves as parents. We don't have to be therapists to therapize with our children. So it's important to understand the stress response in that regard and the physiological changes that happen in our children's and our bodies when we are anxious, when we've got the narrative and all the stuff that's been going on this part that we've all talked about stress tonight, we all, we've all faced our own challenges. And when we do that, we have a stress response, which is brilliant for every day. If I have to grab my child from a burning building or stop it, you know, stop them from running into the road, my stress response will enable me to act really quickly and respond in that regard. If my stress response is constantly triggered, it is even if it's this low level stress that has been going on day to day, that is a worry because we've got the, the sort of the adrenal um, uh, receptors that you know push pushing up all the anxiety hormones and that is a full body response I'm trying to keep it simple but it's a full body response so it's not just what goes on in the brain doesn't stay in the brain it goes on in the body as well and that's really important to remember because we do not want that stress to become chronic which sits in the body if we don't allow it to come out, and I, I talk about it in the book, how we can do that as both adults and children to allow it to come out and be expressed safely, it can sit and become what we call toxic stress. And that is not good for our mental health and it's not good for our physical health either. So there are really serious consequences to it. And I just, I, I that's why I want to get the messages out there because we can all do things that are patterned, repetitive, anything, whether it's drumming or singing or knitting or walking or gardening, all these things are actually soothing that little lizard and bringing us back to balance because it, all these repetitive, there's a brilliant psychiatrist called Dr. Bruce Perry and um, he's become a very sort of close colleague of mine and he's um, been across the book and he talks about this at length. So it's all his work that I reference, but crucially it's ways to enable us to bring ourselves back to calm there's lots of lovely thing in the book the butterfly hug which is a sort of emdr technique which helps the brains come back to balance breathing all these wonderful things so i'll, I'll try and bring it to a close because i think we'd like to get to some questions but it's just as i say i'm passionate this is the book i'm going to give it a little plug there's no such thing as naughty because what it's actually saying is there's no such thing as naughty our children just have needs and my goodness right now they have a lot of needs and the other thing just to bring in now susie obviously we have a formal di diagnosis that you're all too aware of from personal experience but just as a note of caution from me as a as a um, an area of concern and i've been talking to various psychiatrists about this and pediatricians um, that they're concerned that more children who don't have a formal diagnosis, who don't fall under that formal diagnosis, may well be labelled as ADHD because they haven't had the time to play and socially engage, which for brain development is crucial. So it's something, again, to be really aware of in terms of lockdowns, that we must be aware of what the, the sort of unforeseen consequences could be that our children are acting out because they haven't had that time to socialise and, and have that lovely rough and tumble of play. And they could end up with parents thinking, is there something, you know, is there a diagnosis for my child? And the paediatricians are saying, please, we must say to parents, you know, lots of play, lots of rough and tumble right now to release that stress response is a really good way that we can support our children and ourselves. So I'll end on that note, but thank you for listening and thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and there's always hope. There's always hope. There's always repair and always resolution. Thank you, Kate. That was really fascinating. My goodness, there's so much there, really. I, I'll read that with interest, actually. I, I can hear a few uh, 
baboon moments happening uh, <laughs> next door, actually, as we approach bedtime. So uh, yes. I shall read that with great interest. Um, OK, uh, welcome back, everybody. So this is the time where we uh, go into the Q&A. I can see we've had just a jackpot of questions this evening. So uh, we're going to have a we're going to have a time getting through these. We've got 20 minutes set aside. So I will try to do one for everybody. And if we can keep some of the answers, not all of them, but where possible, keep them short so we can maybe encourage some chat between us as well. So let's just dive in. We'll, we'll just scroll down as we go. Susie, um, I guess the first two can almost be read together. Your reasons for writing the book. And uh, an anonymous attendee says she appreciates the humor of the title of the book, Send in the Clouds. And be, she's interested in hearing, or he's interested in hearing the story behind this title. I think you're on mute. Yes, it's a great question. Um, Sending the Clowns is a, a play on the words Special Educational Needs and Disability, the acronym S-E-N-D, and um, also a fam famous stage play that um, some of you may remember, and I love musical theatre, but it's about the, um, the way that a lot of young people with um, neurodiversity like to mask their feelings and they like to act out and they can be very extroverted and the class clown in some cases and it can actually be a way of covering up their um, difficulties with social communication and making friends um, and I like the analogy of you know being sort of outwardly happy you know sort of with a clown face but behind it they can be very upset and very sad about um, their inability to fit in or, or get along with their peers. And it's something that, I mean, there is a, a terminology in the autistic and ADHD world, which is masking. It's a known phenomenon. Um, and so really it's about, it's, it's about all that. Don't, um, don't assume that because a child is acting out, you know, as Kate, Kate said, it isn't always about, um, it isn't always as it looks. So that's what the title is all about. Great, thank you, Susie. Uh, let's see now. Uh, there was one here for uh, Kate. Uh, what, what aspects of your work do you most enjoy? This is another anonymous uh, viewer. Um, researching your stories, writing about them, or presenting them? Um, is that the news side of things? I'm thinking. Is that is it related to the book or them? I guess yes. Stories, writing them, I, and presenting them, yes, it doesn't specify. Does uh, okay, I'll cover quickly both. Um, I love the research aspect. I've always really enjoyed my work in terms of behind the scenes research as a journalist. I think sometimes people think we just sit in front of an auto cue and read it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, actually there's a lot of work. So when I go in, I go in a few hours beforehand. I have a discussion about what, what stories are going to be in, where they sit in the running order. I then write the scripts for them. I write the headlines. Um, I'll look at the packages, maybe make some comments. So um, I, and you know, when I do panoramas, I did, a, I did a panorama last year on trauma in childhood and how it can actually shape the adult we become. So I worked with a lot of prison leavers and looked at trauma in childhood and how that can manifest. So for me, the research is really key. That's why the book has been such a blessing because I had all this, you know, academic work in my head that I've been reading and just to then you know let it flow was was wonderful and I have to say not having an editor anyone to tell me what I could and couldn't say and not that they do in the news but just you know sometimes it's just I was in my little room where I am now and uh you know I'm not censored on the news but you know actually just not having a boss let's put it like that just to write all this stuff was was wonderful and telling people stories is something that I've always enjoyed doing. You know, when I was a teenager, I went into Israel and, and lived on a kibbutz and then went into Palestine and interviewed Palestinian people. I've always been really keen to understand stories from the perspective of people on the ground. And so I guess that's my most nourishing part of, of the work. But I, all of it, really, I, I, I enjoy every aspect of it. But the book's probably the, the bit that I've enjoyed the most, I'd say. Thank you. You know, creative writings. Um, just presenting stuff that you've stored up. It's almost like therapy in itself, isn't it? <laughs> when it? When it gets out there. Um, right, uh, a landmark question. So I guess this is for Leslie. Uh, Leslie, can you please tell us, tell us more about normal people, flea bag, comic relief filming, and fundraising raffle? Does that make sense to you? 
does make sense okay. to me, yes. Um, uh, do you know, one of the funny things about the last year, isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it amazing how quickly time passes, even though you're closed most of the time? Um, I think the filming was last June. It was something we had to keep very, very secret. And basically, um, a local location manager put us forward as a location in direct response to the Save the Landmark appeal for a top secret mashup between the two main actors in Normal People, Paul, by Paul Mescal and Daisy Edgar Jones, and they were to confess to Andrew Scott's hot priest bag. So we had um, a whole day filming with the three of them um, for a comic relief, which was shown in both Ireland and in the UK more recently. And uh, they very kindly um, were upset and interested that we were under such threat. And they signed a print of the landmark by local printmaker Jenny Ng. Um, and we have now started raffling it. We always intended to raffle it. Well, it's actually a, an online prize draw um, because they signed it to help us raise funds. And it was just sort of finding the right time to do it and uh, so yes if you go onto our website and click the link you can enter the draw and um, you might win it it runs until I think it's being drawn on the 19th of September by you know one of these internet algorithms but yeah okay thank you um Riley here's one for you uh Pip says, not actually a question, but I've seen, albeit briefly, some of your actors on Ignite the Facebook posts. One thing that is very striking is how happy and excited everybody looks. Um, uh, can you see just how valuable, you can see how valuable it is for its members? Would you concur with that? Yes, um, thank you. Uh... I think that um, it certainly has proved valuable for um, everybody's mental health and well-being um, during this time. Um, we also have, um, as I said before, we've we've managed to make new collaborations. So um, in some of the pictures that you've seen, they are um, learning disabled actors who were also um, involved in the disability rights movement. So it's all been um, really interesting and interesting experience as well as um, empowering for everyone. And um, yeah, you can't, they do, they are very positive people. <laughs> you, they, they are always smiling. So um, it's- Fantastic. It's kept us all going um, through this difficult time. Great, thank you. Um, Susie, what part does poetry play in your life? And I think there's another question that with HGCSE, your son must have met many teachers along the way. Will he remember any of them? Um, I think he'll remember some of them, but not perhaps for, for the right reasons. Um, he had he had a difficult education. I mean, he he went to um, he's been to many different schools and had lots of exclusions, uh, you know, because of not quite understanding that ADHD is a you know a diagnosable uh, neurological condition and not bad behaviour. So he had a bit of a bumpy ride at school, um, but there have been some teachers who I, I know he'll remember because they've they've taken the time to get to know him and encourage his strengths, such as his, his drawing, for example, and his drama. Um, I always find drama teachers are very understanding <laughs> with uh, children with difference um, and art teachers, which I think is really significant. Um, a lot of the young people that I work with and meet um, have particular superpowers um, in, in their creative, creative sides. And for me, the poetry was, um, you know, a way of me working through um, the, the changing family and my son's diagnosis. And I wrote uh, my first poetry collection, Songs of My Soul, as a sort of dedication to him, really. Um, this last year, last few years, um, I've been completely immersed in, in neurodiversity and um, all of the issues around educating um, kids with difference. So the poetry has taken a back burner and there was so much happening with lockdown. I almost felt that anything I wrote would be very cliched. 
it, you know, it all felt a bit sort of, when you're living through it, um, I mean, lots of poets, as, as Anne will tell you, um, but um, for me, I, I felt I wanted to sort of process a bit more, um, but there will be some, some new stuff coming out in the next year or so, I imagine. Oh, that's good. That's great. And it's very true, the saying, you always remember a good teacher, isn't it? Uh, it must be even more true, but that I can, that I can, I can certainly uh, remember the good ones as yeah. well. Um, thank you. Um, question for Kate. This is a good one, actually. Another anonymous attendee. Looking back over your career, is there a story that is really stuck in your mind? And for what reason? Oh, many stories. <laughs> oh, gosh, just many. I mean, I've reported from the front line in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, so I've lived with with people. I mean, I did a, I think probably, I mean, most things with children, um, as you might imagine, there was a story that I did from Lesotho um, about the HIV crisis. And uh, that was obviously, that just really connected with me. I mean, I've, I've been really privileged. I've had a very eclectic career, but I think when one is on the ground, wherever, whichever country, it's just, you know, I'm always humbled by the families and the fortitude and the resilience and the wonderful kindness that is extended um, in communities. I talk a lot in the book about it takes a village to raise a child and how, you know, the other thing about, you know, not having that social support has been so sort of damaging for parents, especially with young children. And I just <laughs> want to bring that collective so that we can support each other so much more. So I'm sorry, I can't, that I, I guess I could say Iraq only because cheekily that's, I met my husband in the course of um, the training to go out there. So maybe that's going to be more memorable than, than any other for that reason. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, we're doing well here. Quite another question for Bryony. Uh, the performance element of your theatre is very strong. Your players engage with the audience, and I'd like to ask what performance methods your leaders use to help them develop their performance skills. <laughs> okay. Quite a lot there. <laughs> yeah. um, well, our the our leaders, the the performance methods that we use, uh, as I said, are. Uh, um, games from Games for Actors and Non-Actors, which is the arsenal of the theatre of the oppressed. Um, we also, um, we have been as facilitators recently doing some training in drama therapy. Um, and, um, and the kind of method of um, devising, I suppose, is through improvisation. Um, the actors that we have are all very good at improvising and um, we, um, the more practice we have improvising, the, the better we get. So um, it, yeah, those, that's the way that, that we devise the plays. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, here's one for you, Susie. Uh, Sue Pandit says, so good to hear uh, some positives, but we do know that the NHS mental health service for young people are at breaking point. What lesson, what are the lessons that have been learned and what are your thoughts for next year? And she also says, what happened to the diagnosis of ADA, ADHD and ASD over the last year and how have Richmond Council coped? Oh, that's... That's yeah. a lot to, a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, which bit do I do first? Do the um, first bit first. Yeah. Sorry, remind me what the first bit is again. Oh, it's just disappeared from the screen. Well, do, do, do the, the services, the, the challenge of getting services. For yeah, yeah. How, 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 how local services, let's keep it local, because this is about which one. How the yeah. council and local services coped? Well, I think that... Coping. I think that the the from from what I've seen the the services have um, managed through collaboration with charities and voluntary services. I mean, I, I think that um, you know the, the the council cannot meet the needs without the um, you know integration of you know people who are volunteers and people who are working in the charity in the third sector and. It, that seems to be actually that the the place where where families get the um, 
the sort of support and ongoing care that, you know, it, it, in my opinion, it's about you go to, to CAMS for an appointment, but it's what happens between the appointments, how you are held up. Um, because things can flare up um, in between appointments. And I think it's yeah. family to know, what do I do? And, and even if you're, you know, everything on paper is happening, you've got an, an appointment for um, a psychiatrist or an educational psychologist, and you've got an appointment with a school senko. Um, but then it's when, it, when you're at home and you're, you're with your child or with your family, and, and parents say, what do I do? And, and I think a lot of that support network is happening even through you know, various WhatsApp app groups, through various um, charitable bodies. There's a lot of support, you know, peer to peer, parent to parent that's happening. And I personally think that, that is, that's what's kept people, you know, mind and, <laughs> mind and body together through, mm. through the period. And I think, also, the, you know, the local authority is aware of the need to be a listening ear um, and the engagement. So I've done some, some sessions with Health Watch and in terms of you know, feeding back to, to that body and how that all radiates you know, between the, the authority you know, with the AFC as the sort of um, single joining body for the two, the two boroughs, because obviously in healthcare we have it depends on where you live and whether you go to Kingston, yeah, whether there's yeah. Richmond, and it can be confusing. The pathways can be confusing for parents. Yeah. Um, so I think I, I think it, that there's a lot. I have seen improvement. I have seen improvement definitely, um, but I think that there's still a lot of confusion and bewilderment with parents. So it's yeah. it's a, it's a work in progress, definitely a work yeah. in progress. And there's a big challenge of joining up the schools, isn't there? Yeah. You know, threading the whole thing together so it's a integrated whole run a bit there and a bit there and, absolutely you know, so you know, yeah i mean the, yeah. yeah i mean we have the single point of access which which sort of helps um so i mean even the name feels good and and also a lot yeah. of the i know adhd richmond and kingston are doing some great work with the local authority um and with the um you know the uh the sort of CBT offer so there seems to be a lot more joining up and you know that so I can see that 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 process is evolving and has certainly evolved in the sort of you know length of time I've been living in the borough and during my son's diagnosis and and beyond so it's um yeah it, it's it's moving great well that's yes. good to know yes um Kate here's one for you uh from Hillary our Hillary Dogman your book sounds amazing, but who will benefit most benefit from it? I'm concerned that many fraught parents may not have the opportunity to read it. It was look quite a thick uh, blockbuster. Well, you know why it's thick is because hey, well, there is, a, but my request to the publisher was that uh, I have uh, lots of illustrations in there, so I have lots of really cute uh, illustrations, and this is not a sales book because I hear you. So whether it's sort of like a little fluffy owlet or whatever. So I've got lots of illustrations in there um, and sort of brain boxes so that we're, but it's very big writing. And I said that and I said, I demand to have lots of space and, and big font because as a parent myself, I know that feeling of thinking, I just cannot take a book to, to bed and I've got to peer like an old lady looking through it like this. Sorry to anybody who thinks, uh, anyway. Um, so I've got to peer at, uh, this sort of small writing so I said I've got to have large font um, and lots of space and lots of illustrations so it's it's um lots of people have been saying that they've read it in one or two nights and um, one grandmother read it and she said I did it in a day so I've written it to be accessible because I can appreciate it is um there's you know audio is also there but I'm going to start a podcast as well just interviewing a lot of the experts that informed um the science in the book great sounds good um question for Bryony your zoom events talking of multimedia sound great do you plan to continue with any of them yes yes we do we hope to um run um I think 14 zoom workshops this year and what well, another 14 and uh, also we will have um two youtube performances um as well so um it is our plan 
to continue working in the adaptive way as well as returning to in-person workshops as well um, yeah. and that's because we've reached um, different people um, and um, we, yeah we feel like it's been beneficial. Great yes this uh, Zoom world is, is so here to stay isn't it uh, and it's, you know, I think it's going to get better, you know, better slicker as well. Um, okay, well, we've come to the last two uh, questions here, and they're both for Kate. So, Kate, uh, I don't know if you could do a bit of creative um, merging of, of uh, they're not, I think the first one is uh, from Sue. Uh, what are five year olds particularly anxious about from COVID? Five year olds, okay. And um, uh, anonymous att attendee asks, interesting what, uh, uh, to hear what you say about stress, anxiety, and the impact that it can have on the body. Uh, would you like to say more about that, Kate? Okay, let's see if I can yeah. do this. Let's do this just as quickly. Um, well, I think. Look, I mean, all our five-year-olds are going to be different, so it's going to be a different experience. So I don't think we're going to say that it's the same for all of them. But I think for children in general, at the moment, um, we in the book I talk about the still face experiment, which is a, an experiment which is actually quite distressing to watch. It's only done in very brief periods, but it's been uh, replicated a lot, and it looks at the impact of a, a baby looking at a parent who's playing, playing, playing. Lovely, lots of face expressions and then just sits there with a still face and it's been shown how overwhelming that is for the nervous system and my concern at the moment is that our babies our young children are not getting the full expression of our faces all the time because you know that that is actually overwhelming for the nervous system because we've just got eyes so that's a sort of survival response so um you know i'm throwing that out as a point of interest more than anything else just because i think it's really important to be aware of what our children need in terms of their brain development from us as human beings and it's around the face this is the best toy for our children um so in terms of anxiety there's a natural anxiety you know seeing things that are maybe sort of less um, what you know what human nature had intended in terms of you know covers up um, I think that's to be taken into consideration I think obviously parental anxiety at the moment which is completely understandable there's been grief around bereavement around loss you know pa parents are having a very difficult time so if we're not regulated and I frankly don't know a single parent that hasn't been stressed this last year of young children uh, or, or older so that stress obviously can sort of feed out our children pick up on that so there's all sorts of things and I think look we are all responding in a, a normal way for an abnormal event and I think it's important to have compassion for ourselves in that moment just to understand and looping in the next question is that when there is anxiety and wherever it might come from, whether it's in a, on the street or whether it's the stuff going on in the home, as inevitably there is at the moment, I don't think anyone has escaped challenge. When there is, it will sit, it will manifest in the body for all of us, which is why it's really important to, to know that for our children. Because as I say, there's, there's enormous amount of research. You look at the people like Nadine Burke Harris in the United States or Bruce Perry or Gabor Mate or Bessel van der Kolk, all the people I reference in the book who talk about toxic stress and how that sits in the body and that is damaging for our physical health as well as our mental health. All of this stuff can be resolved and lovely to bring back to Susie's point as well and, and to uh, Bryony as well, well, and Leslie, the creative arts are brilliant for getting us moving around and shaking. You know, I talk about how we can shake it out in the book in terms of as animals, we've sort of lost our way in terms of being physical. We need to be physical. And actually maybe that's why drama teachers and the creative arts, they understand the power and the magic of movement. And that is actually healthy for our brains. And I think when we understand that, we can forgive ourselves when we're feeling anxious and think, actually, this is just my stress response. And if my child is having what we used to think was a tantrum, actually that is the stress response in full display and this is not just me saying that by the way this is all the scientists that i've interviewed that is a stress response and when we understand that we can act with more compassion and understanding and coming back to susie's point in scotland susie i did a this panorama there is no permanent exclusions in the schools across scotland because maureen mckenna the director of education said no we are not going to exclude any children we are instead going to understand what they are telling us with their behavior and we are going to respond with compassion and their exclusions have come down to zero. So we can learn lessons all the time when we look at our children and think, what do you need from me right now? And, and, and you know, and, and with the neurodiversity, 
different children are going to need different things but actually by responding as human beings we can help an awful lot and that's we mustn't forget that to sort of we are human and let's not lose what it is to be human mm, absolutely can i just say one more thing um nick before we of course, of course. i think i think the the power of the creative arts i mean this is being hosted by arts richmond is one of the things that has saved certainly my son and many of the young people who crossed my path in various different ways, either through their parents. They all feel free through the arts, whatever it might be. And some have even said, um, because they excel at drama, that they can they feel they can be themselves. They haven't got to worry about um, their difficulties, their difference, their speech, their communication, because when they are someone else, when they're doing something on the stage, or any performance, yeah. they feel free. And I think that that to me is, is a fantastic thing to bear in mind when we're thinking about you know, creative spaces and creative um, yeah. activities for our young people. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there is so, you know, there's so much packed into that, you know, the endorphins about how confidence can increase when they get involved in things like this, about when they sing, they lose speech impediments. I mean, there's just nothing not to like, is there? I mean, the arts are uh, do so much donkey work, in my opinion, on not only this area, but social cohesion and you know, people meeting each other and networking and stuff like that. It's, you know, for, for something which is often, uh, you know, a, a challenge when it comes to funding and stuff like that, it's not often appreciated, the, the donkey I mean, work it does. Nick, you know, and, and this yeah. is it. It's not a nice to have. This is all science. Yeah. What we're all talking about is actually the soothing and regulating of our children's brains, of our brains. It's actually yeah. scientifically shown to be doing us good. So it's not a nice to have. Yeah. We abs it's absolutely vital and never more is it needed than in the current climate as we yeah. come out of lockdown. Yeah. So, you know, if we can rail again, we can rail behind that, then so much, so much the better. I do play therapy in my work and it's just uh -huh. what comes up is wonderful. You know, yeah. you see stuff Stuff just sort of getting resolved just on the page whether it's finger painting or sand play or whatever so it's we know it works yes and when people are often put in a position where they have to improvise whether it's drama or comedy or anything like that it, it sometimes has astonishing results that people don't believe they can do unless unless they try and get in that space so uh, yeah it's uh, absolutely it's not a nice to have and we well we'll, we'll do we'll do our bit anyway uh, in uh, we uh, you know obviously interact a lot with the council, but other bodies as well, and uh, we we want to get uh, be have a sort of exemplary uh, area here when it comes to the arts and all of, all of them and what they can do for everybody. Well, uh, has anybody else got any uh, comments they'd like to make on that? I, was, I think I'm just going to say one yeah. thing, if I may, just on that subject. I mean, you're absolutely right, Kate. I mean, we found. So many people who do our art classes, you know, often older people who live on their own yeah. and that trip to come and do their art class and be with other people once a week was their lifeline. Also in this COVID time, I don't know if you're aware, but there's a national petition to get the government to rethink the restrictions around amateur singing because we've been able to bring our art classes back, but our choirs still have to go on Zoom and that's yeah. such a challenge and the, just talking to some of them today, um, people are so resentful about the fact why can't we get back um, and anyway hopefully so if, you, if you're minded to so there's a nationwide petition now asking the government to reconsider the ban on amateur musicians and amateur singers meeting at the moment so yeah everyone signed that petition it might help <laughs> indeed i know a few people who have as well thanks leslie well look we've hit the uh, nine o'clock time i'd like to thank everybody it's been a, a wonderful way to finish talking lockdown F fascinating speaking um i don't know about you i was doing this live stuff i tend to go into the reptilian brain mode with this so i'll be uh, i'll be i think it's uh, high time now to crack over the bottom and uh, and enjoy uh, you know, a really great evening that we've all had. So I'd just like to finish off before I hand back to St Vince to say, uh, look out, watch the space. We've got a lot of uh, exciting events in all different areas of the arts to uh, come out in Richmond this year. So 
keep an eye on our website, www.artsrichmond.org, and uh, you'll find about it there. So until next time, thank you, goodbye, and I'd like to hand back um, to Sir Vince to close the evening. Well, thanks, Nick, um, and I'll just add my thanks to yours. Uh, a really great panel and a, a very good evening. And thanks to the audience too, um, you know, and hope that they stay with us and stay with Arts Richmond and join the more open participation that we, we're, now, we're hopefully now going to get. Just a few reflections. Uh, I mean, first, we've heard tonight a lot about, you know, people with different forms of vulnerability. We don't often think of as being the main consumer of the arts or the people who contribute to it. But I think what has come out very substantially is how there's so much benefit derived from participation and people who are often the people who've been most hit by the pandemic. So it's been really enlightening to hear about these very positive outcomes. I think as hopefully we approach the end of lockdown, I mean, it's, it's useful to reflect a little bit on the pros and the cons. I mean, you know, from my point of view, and I think a lot of others, we've been able to do new things and I've been able to finish books, do new things like podcasts and have conferences with people in different parts of the world at the same time. But there's been a big downside, not having access to live concerts, go to the cinema. In my case, not being able to go to dancing classes that started again. So, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, just just to conclude with, with Nick's thoughts from the beginning that we may be continuing this. My first reaction was to say, oh no, hopefully we've got to the end of it. But, but actually, um, it may be that, that the hybrid existence, as it's been called, mixtures of live uh, and um, Zoom type conversations is a sort of permanent feature now. You know, there, there are you know, positives in that that may continue long, be, long beyond the, the lockdown. So thanks again to everybody listening and participating uh, and look forward to seeing you again at live events.